Next up on This Week in Law, Stefan Kinsella and Harry Surden join Evan Brown and me. We'll talk about the FCC getting the SOPA treatment, piloting a Nautilus through SCOTUS's patent wonderland. We're going to have some other strange boats, too, and talk about the law's role regarding kids' cruelty on social media. Much more, too, on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. And with for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell and Evan Brown, episode 267, recorded July 18th, 2014. Ella Mossonary, my dear Watson. Hi, folks. I'm Denise Howell, and you're joining us for This Week in Law. Thank you so much for joining us. We're thrilled to have you, and we hope you're going to be thrilled to be here. We have an awesome panel for you today. We haven't done too much on the Supreme Court's recent patent decisions, and we're definitely going to get to that today, plus a whole bunch of other great stuff at the intersection of law and technology. And to help us understand it all, we've got Stefan Kinsella joining us once again here on the show. Hello, Stefan. Hello, Denise. Glad to be here. Great to have you back. What's going on with you these days? Well, trying to stay out of the Houston heat in the summer, but having a good summer and uh, following all these patent cases and uh, IP developments, it's uh, it's interesting to watch. But uh, so far, everything is going very well. I, the good thing about being on your show is uh, I save time because I listen to it anyway. So uh, <laughs> now I can save the podcast uh, for for the walk. That's wonderful. Um, great. We could save you some time and make room for somebody else in your podcast lineup. Uh, also joining us, a return visitor to Twill, is Harry Certain from University of Colorado at Boulder's Law School. Hello, Harry. Hey, Denise. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for joining us. Great to have you back. It's really great to be back. So uh, tell us about Boulder in the summertime. Make us all jealous. <laughs> Boulder in the summer is outstanding. I mean, I can't say enough about it. There's millions of hikes just within the city borders, and it's beautiful. This has been a particularly mild summer, and it's sunny almost every day. So it's quite lovely, I must say. (laughs) I knew that was going to be the case. Yeah. Uh, Just, you know, I was hoping for maybe a random thunderstorm shaking things up for you, but... Actually, no, we wish you uh, a wonderfully beautiful summer. And uh, also enjoying the lovely summer weather in Chicago, Illinois, is Evan Brown. Hello, Evan. Hi, Denise. Yes, I am thrilled to be here. And, uh, you know, as nice as it would be to be in Boulder, I guess the second best place is to be sitting in front of a computer somewhere else on Twill talking with the three of you. So this ought to be a lot of fun. So it's great to be here. The weather's always good on Twill. That's right. It's always sunny here. Good climate control. All right. Well, uh, let's check out the patent on uh, the the patent climate recently in the wake of a couple of important Supreme Court decisions and some other good patent news. Uh, So let's go there first. Let's head into uh, Wonderland via a Nautilus, if we can. Uh, A couple of big cases out of the Supreme Court this year, one called Alice, one called Nautilus, uh, and uh, really need to have a better understanding of these because they're already being applied by other courts. So let's start with Stefan. Stefan, can you tell us uh, the significance of each of these cases and sort of your take on them? Well, I think generally um, the significance is uh, a few things. The court has been pretty much unanimous in most of its patent rulings. Uh, they have pretty much reversed the federal court, the, uh, the, the court of appeals for the federal circuit in most of their recent holdings. And it seems like they're basically trying to clarify the law, have it be more certain, which was one of the goals of the federal circuit in the first place, which it seems not to have done too good a job of in recent um, years. Um, and also to sort of push the rules slowly in a direction towards clamping down on frivolous patents, frivolous patent claims, uh, patent troll assertions, things like that. Um, and I don't think we want to get too much into the boring patent lawyer weeds, but you know there are different uh, aspects of patent law. 
Um, one of them is uh, the requirement to have a, an enabling disclosure. Another is to have enough uh, specificity in your claims. Um, and the Nautilus case I thought was pretty good because it, 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 it it's really going to affect patent trolls a lot and companies that assert patents that have vague claims. Um, it's basically an attempt to impose certainty on the law. One of the justifications for patent law is that it's similar to property law and that the claims set out the meets and bounds of property. And usually in the case of, say, land, you can tell where the borders are pretty easily or at least it's determinable. Um, and in a patent, if you, you have to use words to describe the meets and bounds of the, of the patent claim. If you don't clearly define it, then you just create a lot of uncertainty, and this can be used in legal bullying by – or even extortion as some call it. By the patent owner because the 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 target of the patent assertion is not sure whether they will win or not because it's not clear exactly what's claimed. Um, to be honest, I think patent lawyers even take advantage of this. Sometimes they will throw in extra claims which have an intentionally broad, I'm sorry, vague aspect because they figure they may be able to get this past the examiner, and it doesn't really hurt your client to have a vague claim. The patentee. It doesn't suffer any cost whatsoever from having a vague claim in the patent as long as some of the other ones are, are, are clear um, because you can always theoretically use that vague claim uh, in defense or for offensive reasons. Um, and so patent attorneys will take advantage of the system, and patentees will as well. So I think it's good. What the court did was they, they basically uh, uh, clamped down on the standards that you can use to overturn a claim. Uh, for being too indefinite, okay. So they made it easier to do that. So I think that's a good, uh, a good, a good move. Um, and in some of the other cases, they're also ratcheting back on the scope of patentable subject matter. Um, but the most, probably the most important thing is the fact that most of these rulings are unanimous, and so there's at least a fairly uh, clear ruling. Um, I can't say the same thing about their copyright rulings, like in the Aereo case, but uh, mm -hmm. at least in the patent field, I think they're um, they're doing. They're basically doing the, the CAFC's job for them. Um, so the idea of whether we need a CAFC is becoming scrutinized. If everything's going to be appealed to the Supreme Court anyway, why do we need a, a federal appellate court that is effectively the, the the junior Supreme Court for patents? Why not have a diverse uh, uh, multi-circuit system like we have in other federal appellate litigation where different circuits can approach the problem and they can learn from each other and the Supreme Court can decide conflicts if they have to. So um, that's 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 a summary of some of the trends that are going on now in, the, in these patent cases. Right. And for anyone not to up on their lawyerly uh, acronym, CAFC would be the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, the court that hears patent cases um, and has jurisdiction over them. Uh, Harry, how is the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals faring these days? Um, well, uh, let me just, before I answer that, let me just mm -hmm. comment that I, I really agree that the single biggest force driving patent law at the Supreme Court for the last 10 years or so has been patent trolls. And uh, most of your viewers may know what patent trolls are, but for those who don't, these are folks who are variously called non-practicing entities or patent assertion entities, but are basically companies that tend not to make actual physical products, but just tend to buy patents and make their money by suing on patents, usually against companies that actually make things like technology companies or provide goods and services. So uh, they're a very controversial, it's a controversial business model to be buying patents for the purpose of suing and monetizing uh, when you tend not to make products that people use. And uh, this has really been a phenomenon of the 2000s, maybe late 1990s, and it has really dramatically shifted patent law. So you can read the Supreme Court's decision in Alice and in the Nautilus case is really uh, being reactive to this context of uh, patent trolls uh, trying to make it harder for patent trolls or non-practicing entities to be successful in uh, extracting money using vague or uh, overly abstract patents. So a, a very common technique for one of these non-practicing entities is to buy 
and a patent that's quite old. So patents last uh, for about 20 years. Um, so patent trolls will buy a patent, you know, maybe in its 15th to its 20 year and use a technology that was invented, you know, 18 years ago that's something completely different, but whose language can be uh, arguably mapped onto a modern day technology and approach that modern day company and say, hey, uh, you know, it's going to cost five to ten million dollars to resolve this in an actual patent litigation lawsuit. So if you just pay us a couple hundred thousand dollars, we'll go away and uh, on to the next guy. So that's really the context. I think the best way to understand the recent Supreme Court litigation. And so, um, sorry. So we know that, that the Innovation Act didn't go anywhere, right? We're not getting patent reform coming out of Congress anytime soon. So are these two, and, and there were some other decisions from the Supreme Court, uh, sort of helping with that situation, uh, helping flood the uh, tide of patent troll litigation? I, I really think they are. So Congress is in kind of a stalemate when it comes to significant patent reform, because uh, the backstory is there are two major in uh, industries that are at opposition with one another. On the one side, we have the pharmaceutical and life sciences industry, which heavily depend on patent protection. And in that area, by and large, the patent system is working quite well. So they put a lot of their lobbying efforts into making sure that very little changes in the current patent system for fear of uh, hurting their interests. On the opposite side of the spectrum is the technology industry, where the patent trolls are the most active, and there's a lot of uh, criticism of software patents and to what extent they're useful. And by and large, the consensus is that patents don't work very well in the technology sector. So they're pushing from the other side, advocating for reform. So the upshot is Congress uh, basically reacts by not doing much because they're caught on either side. So what's interesting is the, the courts are kind of coming in and are the entity that are dealing with these really significant problems much more effectively than Congress has over the years. And I think the Supreme Court has done a really, a lot of really good improvements to the patent system in the last 10 years that the federal circuit, for whatever reason, wasn't able to get to those same results. Uh, Denise, can I add one more thing? Yes, please. Um, just so we should make clear. Um, uh, uh, I am a I am a patent attorney, but I'm. Some people may not know. Watching, I'm one of the world's biggest opponents of the whole patent system. So let me be clear that um, uh, I want to say something of the patent troll system. Um, the reason I think these are good decisions is because they slightly weaken the patent system in general. But I think that. It really, there's really not much wrong with patent trolls per se, given the patent system. They're not the biggest problem at all, and I think this whole issue is a distraction. Um, um, it, there is no requirement in the patent law to make or practice an invention to have a patent on it. That's been part of it for 200 years. So the idea of a patent troll is really – a non-practicing entity is perfectly permitted within the law, and most companies that make products or in a sense – patent trolls because a lot of the patents they have in their portfolio don't cover products that they make. The idea is this. If you sue someone for violating one of your patents that might cover one of your products or might not, it's possible that if you're a competitor, you're making similar products and they in your and the and the target of your patent lawsuit may have in their stack of patents a patent that covers something that you're doing. So they they have it's a fair fight in other words. So they can um, they can assert a, a counterclaim against you for infringing one of their patents. So the idea that the patent fight is more fair, although the patent attorneys, of course, make tens, tens of millions of dollars off of this process, and usually the companies agree with each other to settle, and when they do that, they shut out smaller competitors and they maintain their cartels and their oligopolies. So the entire patent system – and I, I, would, I would respectfully disagree with Harry. Uh, I don't think the patent system works well anywhere unless you mean that it works well for entrenched business industries and um, – uh, the patent, the patent bar, um, it's basically a, a huge damper on innovation and a huge cost in the economy, and it totally distorts the structure of research and development. Um, I think patent trolls are actually the least of our problems because at least the patent troll just wants 
to take a taste, right? They're like they're like the mafia threatening a guy that runs a shop down the street. They just want a little bit. They don't want to kill the business. They just want to tax it. So it's like a small tax. Whereas your competitor may want to shut you down, right? So Apple, Samsung, all these smartphone patent wars. So in a way, patents held by competitors are a bigger threat um, than patents held by patent trolls. If I had to choose, I would get rid of regular patents before I got rid of patent trolls. And if I could have a system with only patent trolls, that would probably be less bad than a system where people can patent their actual products and use them to stop, stop competition. Well, Stefan, it sounds like what you're saying is we need Congress to fix this. We need, you know, the cor the courts and and businesses are doing what they can based on the laws on the books. Uh, we saw uh, representatives Goodlatte and Eshoo um, and various others uh, trying to um, get this uh, patent reform bill through. Uh, the House and Senate, I think it passed the House. It is uh, not yet taken up by the Senate. Um, so f folks are trying not to let it die, but at, at the moment it's stalled. Do you think, is this going far enough, uh, Stefan, or do we need a heck of a lot more? Well, so my view is uh, even the best of congressmen on this issue uh, only wants to slightly reform the system, but there's no challenge to the fundamental idea of IP, and there's no suggestion even among reformists, to do anything radical whatsoever. So any even minor change is called radical by the proponents of the existing system. Um, the, again, the patent troll bill would has been watered down already. It's probably not going to pass anyway, and even if it does, um, it will only have a very minor effect and only, pretty much only on patent trolls, which, as I said, are only a very tiny part of the real problem. The real problem is patent holders. So I think Congress is pretty much firmly uh, – you know, uh, controlled by the special interest lobbyists of the pharmaceutical industry um, and other big tech companies like IBM and Microsoft, which depend upon patents. I mean, Microsoft, I mean, IBM gets what one or two billion dollars a year from patent licenses. They don't want anything to threaten that income stream. Um, so I think they're basically sucking money out of the American economy and impoverishing consumers and reducing innovation um, using Congress uh, to get their will. The only legislative change that I can think of ever in American history that has ever improved patent or copyright law was the, Ob uh, the Obama um, uh, patent law from a couple years ago when they expanded the prior user rights. That's it. Every other change that I can think of ever, legislative changes, the Supreme Court has made some minor interpretive changes recently that are good. But mm -hmm. every legislative change always ratchets up the problem, makes it worse. Terms get longer. Enforcement of copyright gets worse. Um, the scope gets expanded. There's talk about fashion rights. There's talk about copyright-like rights in bartender recipes uh, for drinks. Um, there's always a pressure for more and more anti-competitive laws like patent and copyright law. Um, so it would be a surprise to me the way the, the, the system is rigged um, where Congress is basically bought and paid off by the major lobbyists. And the patent trolls, by the way, are pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into uh, into, into D.C. Um, I, I don't see – and plus the confusion about the whole purpose of the patent system. Um, everyone thinks it's for the inventor and it's for innovation. Um, they don't understand its anti-competitive origins, and it's basically mercantilist and protectionist uh, purpose. That's It's what it is. It's basically completely antithetical to the free market. Uh, but as long as people confuse it with the free market – um, it's going to su survive, and uh, I don't see much hope for any legislative change. So these small incremental steps the Supreme Court has made uh, or at least some sign of hope for a slight um, uh, improvement in the situation. Well, this Let would be a good time on... to – yes, please do pick up on it, but this would be well, a good time to mention since we haven't mentioned on the show yet and just picking up on one of the themes that Stefan was mentioning there – uh, I don't think we've yet mentioned Mayday.us on the show, but this is um, the organization that Larry Lessig has founded to uh, take some of the money out of politics. And uh, it had a funding goal. Uh, it was trying to get to $5 million on July 4th, which it hit. It's raised over $7.6 million, 110 days left until Election Day. Um, it's trying to form a super PAC uh, to address some of the 
frustrating issues that Evan, or not Evan, uh, Stefan was just ranting about. I'm sorry, Harry, jump in. Uh, no, that was Evan. Oh, sorry, Evan, jump in. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, Stefan, you, the things that you say about intellectual property are certainly provocative, and, and had I been hearing them for not the first time, they would have been, uh, you know, the, as shocking as they were the first time I heard you say them. And, and I hope that people are taking it seriously when you say those things, even though it is quite radical to say that IP should be abolished altogether. And and so I wanted to pick up on the thread you saying it being uh, against the free market, essentially mercantilism and, and all of that, and tie that into a another concept that you were talking about earlier about how it's never been a part of the U.S. patent system or probably any patent system for that matter. I don't know, but at least I heard from you, it's always been this way in the U.S. patent system, that it's never been a requirement that you actually practice the art. You can hold a patent, but it may be that uh, you, you just sit and hold it and decide to do whatever. Frame it and put it on your wall and enjoy the fact that you are a patent holder but not engage in commerce. Um, would it change the calculus notably in your mind and would it temper any of the critical – uh, approach that you have toward this, if it were a requirement in patent law, that you actually do have to practice the art, actually engage in commerce, be a part of the the free market economy, rather than uh, sit back and just enjoy these sort of government granted monopolistic rights and use them or abuse them as the case may be. Would that change anything at all, Stefan? Well, so my view, my view is this. The, if you really want to improve the situation, you have to recognize the problem, and the problem is the, the very system itself. Um, and so to my mind, anything that reduces the extent and scope and effectiveness of the system is good. So incompetent enforcement by the government is a good thing in this case. Uh, I don't want you know competent enforcement, but if, if I could say anything that would really help the situation, it would be just the obvious things. Reduce the term. Say patents should go from 17 – roughly 17 years to 10 years, five years, three years. That would be a big improvement. Uh, reduce the scope would be another thing. Um, get rid of treble damages, those kinds of things that just reduce the penalty it exacts on the economy. Um, I would, I think, be in favor of a working requirement. And by the way, um, so the history of patents is it they arose from the practice of uh, uh, you know the, the crown – the monarchs giving monopolies to uh, favored court cronies and others in a certain area to be the only ones who could sell a certain product. Or, you know, I, I think uh, 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 Sir Francis Drake, one of the first uh, privateers or pirates, was given a letter patent. Patent just means open, right, in Latin. So it's just like an open letter from the king saying this guy has the right to do this. That gradually changed with the statute of monopolies in 1623. You see, back in the 1600s, they weren't afraid to call things what they really were. <laughs> we used to have a Department <laughs> of War in the U.S. Now it's the Department of Defense, and uh, uh, he had the statute of monopolies. Uh, they, they, <laughs> they knew what these things were, and that formalized the process and restricted it primarily to innovation and technological invention. invention. Even then, it was still a helter-skelter, ad hoc type process. Um, the, when the U.S. was founded in 1789 and the patent system was was authorized by the Constitution – um, then you started having a modern system, and ever since then, you've never had to provide a working requirement. Um, and the reason is because you have to um, reduce the invention to practice, and theoretically, that means you have to make a working model. But there's a doctrine called constructive reduction of practice, which is when you file a document with the patent office um, that describes it in sufficient enabling and other detail that's called the constructive reduction of practice and i think the idea behind it is that it would be unfair to penalize people that have good enough ideas they can write down on paper i mean there's no requirement that you have to sell the product so i think i would be in favor of, of that requirement only because it would slow down and hamper the process but i and it would increase the cost of getting a patent but one drawback of that was i think it would only further skew the process towards the large companies because they would be able to afford to make working models and smaller inventors would even be less able to do it. So it would only further entrench the cartels and the oligopolies that the patent system helps to prop up um, right now. So I guess I would be mildly in favor of it, but it would only be a patch and it might have some unanticipated um, drawbacks. So, Harry, tell us then what's happened in the wake of Alice and Nautilus, at least one case out of the federal circuit, 
uh, has decided that Acacia Research could not, and they are uh, probably the biggest patent troll out there. They're also uh, my neighbor here. I was getting my hair cut, you know, within a block of their office yesterday. Uh, and uh, however, they just got their ha hat handed to them by the federal circuit in a case involving photography. Yeah, so uh, so I, I think that the Alice case is uh, just a third in a string of cases in which the Supreme Court is saying abstract patents are bad. And as I said before, I think what's driving that is the fact that patent trolls have been using a variety of patents with a lot of vague or very abstract words, uh, arguing that their patent covers very general uh, or uh, inventions or inventions that have been invented before. But I think actually the Alice case is much less significant than the Nautilus case, which was, uh, that was the one Stephen talked about, the definiteness case. That actually dramatically changes patent law. So it used to be the case up until the Nautilus case that uh, patent words should be rejected if they're too indefinite. Uh, but the Federal Circuit had interpreted indefinite to mean uh, incapable of any definition. Um, and the Supreme Court said that is too low a bar. And in fact, we're going to say uh, indefinite means that if somebody in the art can't understand what it means. But the, the upshot of that is a whole bunch of words that were uh, previously used by patent trolls to cover inventions that they really didn't invent there's now another uh, arrow in the quiver of the courts to say, hey, uh, this is too uh, indefinite, this word is too vague, this patent is invalid. So I think that's going to have a really significant effect. Um, the courts previous to that under the Federal Circuit's uh, ruling really uh, had their hands tied, and even in the face of very ambiguous or vague words, couldn't do much in the way of invalidating them. Now they have a lot more uh, ability in the wake of the Nautilus decision. Um, the Alice decision, I think, was really nothing new uh, following the Supreme Court's uh, recent decisions in Bilski and Prometheus, where they basically said, if you have an invention and it's too abstract, then uh, that's not patentable if you claim it that way. So I think not much has changed there, although it does again, give the courts a little more ammunition in kind of invalidating uh, these very vague patents. Um, one, one thing I wanted just to point out to Stephen's point is your readers or your viewers might not know that there's kind of uh, a division between two kinds of non-practicing entities, uh, maybe what someone would call the bad non-practicing entities, which are the patent trolls. And these are the companies whose business model is based upon buying uh, patents and uh, monetizing them. And I only say bad in quotes because some people, as Stephen said, uh, just see it as really the symptom of the patent system, not really the disease. Um, and I, I do actually agree with that to some extent that practicing entities uh, are not morally better or worse. Uh, but I just want to point out that there's this other uh, category of non-practicing entities, which are universities. So universities do a lot of basic research, and by and large, when they get patents, they don't practice their patented inventions in the sense that you know uh, MIT or Stanford don't have a factory uh, where they're making the things. By and large, they license out their patented inventions. So they, too, are non-practicing entities. So uh, I think the biggest opposition against a requirement to practice your invention would be that it would be to hurt universities, um, who are some of the biggest engines of research and development in the United States. Um, and I think the universities, particularly the University of Wisconsin and some other universities, have been very actively opposing some of these reforms, including the requirement to practice your invention. Yeah, that's an interesting point. They don't come up a lot in the discussion. They, um, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but my impression is they don't um, take their patent portfolios and pursue people who may be infringing. Um, that's not the university business model. As you said, Harry, it's more about licensing 
to people who come to them. Do you, do you know of any universities who are out there aggressively enforcing their patents in litigation? The University of Wisconsin is uh, notable for being very aggressive in some of its life sciences portfolio. But I think by and mm -hmm. large, you're right. The universities are not out there aggressively uh, you know, uh, pursuing their patent portfolio. I, so let's get I back thought to there the... was a... Oh, sorry, I just was. I thought there was a okay. recent couple of cases. MIT or Stanford uh, had have extracted like a about a billion dollars um, in a couple of uh, cases, and those are clearly backed by the threat of litigation. So they are classic trolls, and the, a lot of their patents are sold to patent trolls and become used by patent trolls. So the universities are exactly the same um, as part of the problem as the the, the patent troll problem, I believe. Got it. And certainly universities are all about protecting uh, their income streams wherever they uh, may originate. Uh, they have to, obviously, to keep going. Um, but, uh, you know, we shouldn't think of them as, as somehow above um, enforcing their patents. Uh, doesn't, if, that, if doesn't that seem pretty necessary. unfortunate? Doesn't it seem unfortunate if the if the universities are doing too much along those lines? Because isn't there aren't there opportunities? And and I just sort of know the contours of this. I would turn it over to Harry or Stefan. There's the Buy Dole Act, right? That gives a real incentive for federal funding of university projects, right? Am I am I uh, even pointing in a, in a right direction with all this stuff? The the point being that there could be this problem of there actually being taxpayer subsidized research and development going on. And if it's used in an irresponsible way by a university, it seems doubly bad. Is there anything to that? Or am I just sort of mixing up two things and, and missing something here? Um, I, no, I think you're generally right in that. So you're right about the, the act. That is the correct act, which allows the university to share in the benefits of federally funded research. I think there definitely is a concern with, the, with a conflict of interest uh, to some degree, and what's good for society and what's good for the universities. Uh, Stanford um, is famous for having a very large patent portfolio and income stream based upon patents. Um, and uh, many large research universities, University of Colorado included, uh, actively encourage their researchers to get patents and uh, are increasingly becoming dependent on patent licensing fees and revenue. So I think there, it's something to think about, at least, um, if there's some uh, conflict of interest among universities. I, I would agree, too. Uh, they are getting taxpayer dollars, even if it's state taxpayer dollars, and even if Bayh-Dole doesn't come into effect. And, you know, the whole purpose of the university is to expand knowledge and to share knowledge. And the original alleged purpose of the Patent Act is not to stimulate innovation, but to encourage disclosure of information that would otherwise be kept trade secret, right? And so for universities whose mission is to promote human knowledge, um, to be using patents and the threat of patents to stop, say, the best solution to be used in a given research project, uh, you know, to threaten to do that with litigation, I think is contrary to the whole um, um, educational or eleemosynary purpose of a university in the first place. So I do think there's a conflict. And not only that, I think it's kind of rich that a company like Twitter, for example, I don't know if we'll get to this today. This was in our rundown. Twitter's IPA, their their agreement, uh, Twitter basically has agreed to shackle itself with an agreement with its inventors um, so that it can't use patents offensively. It's pretty sad that a private for-profit company like that has a more progressive, pro-technology, pro-sharing, pro-learning policy than most universities do. You would think that that's one way you could appeal to professors and researchers by saying, we're not going to use your patents offensive, offensively. And uh, just as a follow-up, while I would say I'm not as dubious as, about the patent system as Stefan, and sorry, I, I said your name wrong earlier. I apologize. Um, Still, what, one more time, it's Stefan. Stefan, okay, thank you. Third time's the charm. <laughs> Stefan, uh, as I'm um, not as dubious. On the other hand, I will say, in looking at the evidence I've looked at, the, pat the benefits of the patent system are decidedly mixed, so if you look at the academic evidence, uh, you might think that given that we have this elaborate system of intellectual property rights upon which uh, many companies participate, that the evidence would be overwhelming that the patent system confers net benefits to society. 
but the actual evidence is decidedly mixed um, that there are possibly some benefits, significant number of costs, and uh, and some prominent economists have advocated the elimination of the patent system. So while not everybody agrees with that, I'd say the weight of the evidence is that uh, it is mixed with some benefits and some costs. I think many people find that surprising given how entrenched our patent system is in the marketplace, that it's not clearly beneficial to society. I like the idea of something being decidedly mixed. That's, that, right. that, that's great. I'm going <laughs> to yes. take that one down. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump in here to put our first MCLE passphrase in the show. Uh, several of our listeners and viewers like to watch the show because it's educational. And uh, I think probably all our listeners and viewers watch it for that reason. And if you're a lawyer or another professional in a field uh, where our discussions jibe with uh, your subject matter, you may be eligible for continuing education credit. We have um, a wiki, the uh, Twit wiki, wiki.twit.tv. Twill has a page there uh, with a bunch of information about applying for uh, professional credit in your jurisdiction if you're a lawyer. Um, so we put these phrases in the show in case your oversight body needs to know that you actually watched or listened and didn't just, you know, jot down episode 267 on a piece of paper somewhere. Um, I would love to make Ella uh our first word, but I think I'm going to go with my, because uh, I, I don't think people are going to be able to spell it. I don't know if they um, need to spell it, but it's an awesome word. <laughs> I'm going to go with something a little easier to... Uh, uh, spell, which was my own sort of Freudian slip in talking about the tide of patent litigation. I believe I said flood the tide rather than stem the tide, um, which uh, seems to be at least uh, the past trend uh, was for the tide to continue to flood. So let's make it flood the tide. Um, and let's talk next about uh, Alice and Nautilus and Highmark and various other decisions out of the Supreme Court this last term, and whether they are stemming the tide or not, really this all comes down to the federal circuit, Harry, and, and right, and whether uh, the Supreme Court has now given it significant, uh, sufficient guidance and guidelines to on how to handle these cases. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think the, and in particular, I'd focus on the lower district courts, which are the courts that patent infringement lawsuits are filed. So they take their marching orders about patent law from the federal circuit, who in turn takes their marching orders from the Supreme Court. So I, I think the federal district courts, the trial courts who see these patent infringement cases now have a lot more tools to deal with uh, patent trolls or in frivolous litigation. Uh, thanks to the Supreme Court they're more able to award fees, um, uh, attorney's fees against uh, in frivolous cases. They're more able to invalidate um, poor quality patents. So one of the biggest problems that uh, involving patent trolls, as I mentioned, are, for instance, the use of uh, old patents that covered technologies that were, you know, 18, invented 18 years ago that have nothing to do with technologies today. So a really infamous example that's going on right now is uh, somebody who has a patent on uh, sending audio tapes through the mail is claiming that that patent covers podcasts and, you know, something that was uh, not even thought about back in the mid-1990s when this invention uh, came about and is going around suing a lot of purveyors of podcasts saying, hey, if you read my words uh, very abstractly, you can see that I've actually claimed podcasts. So I actually invented uh, podcasts. And everyone knows that, you know, the inventor of this patent did not actually invent podcasts. It's just that the language can be used to cover an after arising later technology. And in many cases under the Federal Circuit's earlier case law, the district courts, trial courts, had their hands tied in dealing with um, patents like this because they didn't have a lot of uh, tools to deal with it. But now the Supreme Court increasingly is giving them more tools, more discretion to deal with uh, somewhat frivolous cases like this. 
Right. Uh, thank you so much for mentioning the podcast patent. It's certainly one that we've covered in the past and have been watching uh, the litigation grind on close to Stefan's neck of the woods in the Eastern District of Texas. Stefan, do you think that these recent Supreme Court decisions will impact that case? Uh, I do. And um, I agree with Harry. Um, I think another one we didn't mention, which was another big one, was the the, the, the limelight case, right, which had to mm -hmm. do with induce, inducing infringement, which is similar to a doctrine um, in copyright law. And um, what's a little bit interesting to me about this case is how the court made the right decision, I think, legally, um, w whereas they made the wrong decision in the um, in the Aereo case. Uh, in, in both cases, you have someone who you could accuse of taking advantage of a loophole in the law, the patent law, the copyright law, and yet in one case it's okay and the other it's not. In, in the induced infringement case, the idea is that to infringe a patent, you have to – one person, one corporate person or natural person has to – perform every step listed in a method patent or, or has to um, make, use, or sell every element of, a, of an apparatus patent claim. Um, so one person has to do everything claimed in the patent claims to be in a, a direct infringer. And then inducing infringement can only come after that. You could be guilty of inducing infringement if there's first direct infringement by some person. And in this case, they held, I think, quite properly based upon um, the statute and uh, uh, case law up to up – to, this, this time that if one company does A, B, and C, and the patent claim has A, B, C, and D in it, let's say, and then the customer of the company does D, then there's no one person performing all four steps, and therefore um, the company can't be held liable under induced infringement because there's no, there's no direct infringement. So I think that's a good result actually, and that will give companies the ability to um, design their internet services and products around this by making sure the customer has to do the final step or something like that if there's a patent that's threatening this method. Um, so that's a loophole. That's a way of getting around the law by complying with the law, which is a good thing, which is what the law wants to direct people to do. And that's what Aereo tried to do in the copyright context by complying with the way the statute is written. Um, and the court just totally uh, – they did a Bush versus Gore type analysis, I believe, in this one. They just did a totally results-oriented um, one-of-a-kind thing with no – they didn't want it to apply outside this narrow ruling because they knew it was not an honest uh, reading of the law, I believe. Um, but in any case, at least in the patent field, the court seems to be better than in the copyright field. Um, and let, let me just weigh in a little bit on the federal circuit. So mm -hmm. uh, I might be the you know only person in America to slightly defend the federal circuit, and I actually <laughs> disagree with a lot of their decisions. But here's how I'll defend them: the issues in front of them are very hard, and there's no obvious, clear answer one way or the other for the vast majority of cases. So the Federal Circuit is kind of muddling their way through. Uh, patent practitioners disagree on the outcomes of these issues. Patent attorneys disagree. Uh, patent professors disagree. So every time you see a 9-0 decision from the Supreme Court overruling the Federal Circuit, which is pretty common, the Supreme Court makes it seem like the Federal Circuit got it obviously wrong and the Supreme Court got it obviously right. But I just want to say, in my belief, that's not necessarily the case. Um, I think a lot of these issues are tricky and could have come out either way. And while I have tended to agree with the outcome of the Supreme Court over the Federal Circuit on some of these issues, they were by no means clear-cut, easy answers that the Federal Circuit was obviously getting wrong for the most part. Can, can, I, can I make a, a, a little comment on that? I, I actually agree with everything you said there. Um, let me just say that my view as a libertarian, to, put, to wave my libertarian flag, is that the reason for that uh, is that this is not objective law that they're interpreting. This is just rules written down by a bunch of bureaucrats called legislators that has nothing whatsoever to do with justice. Um, so in a way, I agree with the crits, the critical legal studies movement, that law, if you interpret it as statutory law, is by and large not objective. It's got nothing to do with justice. It's not aimed at justice. The judge's job in these cases is not to try to get the right result. Their job is simply to interpret words, words that were cobbled together by a, a, you know, a bureaucratic process by a bunch of people writing, uh, words that are not always consistent with each other and that don't have objective borders and they're not anchored in justice and property rights. So I don't blame the judges on either court for getting it wrong. I don't think there's even a right answer. All we can really do in some cases is 
hope for consistency, hope for certainty, and hope for the right result that comports with justice even if the statute is not aimed at that. So the reason I like what the Supreme Court's done is it happens to be in the right direction, but I wouldn't fault the the other judges for um, having a tough time interpreting these totally non-objective, uh, almost arbitrary statute, you know, legislated words which have ambiguous meanings. Uh, uh, you know, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, what is a reasonable accommodation? Uh, what is obviousness really? What is statutory subject matter uh, really? What is fair use under the Copyright Act? I don't think anyone really knows because there is no there's no answer because they're just words written on paper a, as an outcome of the political process when people that write it are subjected to influences by special interest groups. Well, there is a lot to unpack there. Uh, Evan, being our philosophical touchstone for the show, anything you want to add before we move on to um, some market reactions to the patent system? Sure. Well, I, I would hate to stand in the way of getting into the compelling discussion about market reactions in the patent <laughs> system. But, uh, you know, just to touch on the idea that, that you were saying there, Stefan, about it not being related to justice, I mean, that seems... I mean, at best, I can just say, I guess I'd say that that's intriguing because I, I whenever you start talking about, you know, critical theorists, it seems, it seems like such a, um, such a, such a difficult place to be in because it seems like it's just going to quickly break down because all a critical theorist has to do is just say, well, here's the status quo. I'm going to go against that. And I'm just going to say that it is meaninglessness. And, and, you know, how can you argue against that? <laughs> you know, it really has to sort of be the, the end game. Then once you say that whatever is written is, is uh, meaningless and there's no objectivity to it or, or what have you, I, I would tend to think that you know, yes, statutory law may have been cobbled together by bureaucrats that we call legislators. Um, you know, and and that is what it is. But does that necessarily mean, though, that it has no ability to at least point toward or tend toward justice? Maybe I'm being way too Thomistic, you know, thinking of natural law, something trying to permeate through, you know, statutes that are promulgated here is to sort of tending towards some objective, real justice, and and I guess I would want to take that side of things as as being sort of a little less hopeless and sort of uh, less. Uh, aimless in, in the fact that, you know, if we're going to legislate something, if we're going to recognize interests, and yes, they do get embodied in statutes, it, it may be imperfect, but at least it's tending towards something that's better than the alternative, which would just be complete anarchy. So I don't know if I'm formulating well, a question or anything, just, you know, sort of, sort of uh, put that back. Let me have a quick response to that. Um, uh, well, first of all, law didn't used to be thought of as legislation. It was the customary and developed body of rules that were developed by courts and decentralized processes in the search for justice. Um, and so you wouldn't have anarchy even if you didn't have legislation or if you didn't have as much legislation. Um, and there may be tendencies for legislation to tend towards some just results just because of the democratic process and our values in society. Uh, and furthermore, I do believe that the legislators know that judges think of themselves as doing justice, and so they 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 factor that in, and judges will try to do justice when they can. But the ultimate problem is that judges' job when the, when there's a statute at issue, their job is simply not to do justice. Their job is to interpret the words of the statute, which is you – know, I mean it's a, it's a difference between a, a common law situation where the job of the judge is to try to find a fair, equitable, or just result in a particular case given the developed body of, of rules of justice in the law. Um, so it's just a problem of the way law is made by statute um, that I think causes these judges – I'm defending the judges in a sense. I'm saying that you can't blame them for not knowing how to interpret words that were written intentionally vaguely sometimes in order to reach a political compromise. I mean side A and side B may think the word means something different, but they do that anyway just to get it passed, and then the judges have to decide. And if the judges decide, quote, wrongly or, quote, rightly, I don't know if you can really blame them in every case. I'm not saying law is never objective and the statutes are never objective, and there's not a better reading of some statutes. But quite often the, the, the borders become much fuzzier and vaguer and more ambiguous than um, uh, customary um, and uh, decentralized law would be. Right. We saw, and you mentioned the Aereo case, Stefan, uh, how the statutory 
law uh, and considerations helped drive what you characterize as a results-driven decision when the court delved into the legislative history and pulled out comments around uh, various portions of the Copyright Act to justify its outcome. Uh, but we are getting highly theoretical here. I'm feeling like I'm back in law school in some sort of constitutional law or a critical legal studies class. Uh, so I'm going to divert us back to um, our rundown just a bit here uh, to uh, the question we were uh, talking about earlier with Twitter and its um, intellectual property stance toward developers where it's uh, tying its own hands as far as patent enforcement goes. Uh, we talked just a few shows ago about Tesla doing something similar um, so I wanted to go around and get all of your respective takes on this kind of approach, um, whether this is something where companies are simply playing to a market sentiment, or do you, do you think that there's a bottom line interest being served here? Do you think there are higher ideals being served here? And can we expect to see more of this kind of Hands off, we have patents, but are not going to uh, enforce our rights approach. What do you think, Harry? Um, so I think this is an interesting development. I think it's a mix of marketing and idealism and actually good business sense. So I think it goes a little bit back to the divide I created earlier between industries and technology with IBM sort of being the, one of the notable exceptions. Most technology companies seem to be more harmed by the patent system than they're helped. So consequently, they tend to be opposed to patents. Um, they tend to be targeted a lot by patent trolls and have them used against them much more than they uh, derive benefit. Uh, but I think there is some idealism. So I used to be a software engineer, and uh, there is sort of a current running through the software engineering community that is deliberately anti intellectual property and uh, anti-patent uh, for various reasons that, uh, you know, we can talk about. And I think some of this does reflect that idealism. So I think Google is actually a good example uh, where they have, you know, implicitly pledged not to use their patents offensively, but only defensively. So an offensive patent is where you go out and you sue or you threaten to sue to get licensing fees defensively by contrast is you only use your patents in litigation after somebody sues you first and then you sue them back in terms of leverage and uh, i think some of that idealism is reflected in the uh, tesla announcement um but it's also a bit of marketing too so uh tesla uh got in you know front page in the news uh by releasing their patents by making a pledge. And, you know, that's very good publicity um, to for for Tesla. And they probably weren't going to be able to monetize them all that much. Their interest is much more in establishing an electric car ecosystem. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it's hard to disentangle all these uh, different threads. What do you think, Stefan? Um, I agree with all that. I think it is a mixture of idealism and marketing, which I think is a good thing. They're both good things. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, I think that um, they're recognizing that they need a thriving industry of, of electric cars. They need competitors. It's good for them. It's good for their workers. It's good to have workers that you can hire that know they can change jobs and go to a competitor because then you can get more talented workers in the first place. So they're sort of dimly recognizing the problem with the patent system, um, and I think more and more companies are sort of doing this thing. Like Google, although Google made this pledge, and yet Google has uh, offensively asserted trademarks, I believe, and they of course acquired Motorola Mobility, which had ongoing offensive patents against. Um, uh, some other companies, and they have not quashed those patent suits, I believe. So Motorola's hands are not completely snow white, even in this area, which gets to the other problem I had a little bit with at first with the announcement by Tesla, which I admire and I like. It's a little bit confused in some of its reasoning. But the big problem I have with it is is the question about enforceability, which some of your rundown um, links pointed to, and which the Twitter deal 
aims to solve with this agreement. Um, and I, you had a paper that was interesting too, which I read through the SSRN paper about the enforceability of these sort of promises. Um, ultimately, I'm concerned that, that these are not enforceable agreements. There, there are no, there's not an agreement. There's no terms that you can even read that are really clear. They could be changed at any time unilaterally by the company. Um, at most, I think you could hope for some kind of a stopple based defense to keep someone from going back on their public promise, um, which is sort of what that article by the law professor uh, argues that you link to in, in, the, in the show notes. Um, I'm also concerned about Creative Commons for similar reasons. Um, I may be one of the – a big user of Creative Commons and one of his biggest promoters and supporters, but I, I, I may have a mental – gap because I have not seen a convincing analysis that any Creative Commons license is really enforceable. There's no consideration. Um, there's no clear way for the customer who gets the license to prove that he had a license. What if the the website just removes the Creative Commons notice five months later after you've downloaded it and used it in a book? So I'm a little bit concerned about all of these things. Um, which is not the fault of the companies trying to use them. The fault is the copyright and patent system, which makes it difficult to to leave the system. Um, I think you talked last week, Denise, about this IRS ruling, which mm -hmm. basically says that um, open source nonprofit companies can't get a nonprofit uh, 501c3 status if they don't try to enforce copyrights against people. Um, so it's almost like the federal government is punishing you you know, by taxing you if you don't use their copyright system that they foist on the economy as well. Um, I'm not sure which one props up the other. If copyrights prop up the tax system or vice versa, but they, they obviously are intertwined with each other and go hand in hand. And some of my friends have even hypothesized that something similar is happening with Tesla. Tesla has been so uh, – they're receiving a lot of criticism lately partly because they're, they're – Refusing to use the patent system. They're, they're announcing that they don't like to use it either, so they're starting to get some pushback from the established players as well because they're not playing the game, and they're starting to not use the system. So as more and more companies start voluntarily uh, renouncing the use of the copyright and patent system, um, I expect them to get more and more criticism for not being um, you know, uh, good team players. Have um, you seen the Model 3, by the way, the Model 3 Tesla? Yes. Very sleek looking car. Looks sweet. <laughs> yeah. They're, and, uh, what, they're certainly, they may be getting criticism, but I, I think they're going to, you know, have a product on the market that people want. I'm sorry, Harry, I digress. Oh, oh no, that's okay. Uh, I thought the Model 3 <laughs> was a cool looking car. Um, yeah. Although not a particularly creative title. Um, no. <laughs> or model. Uh, but one thing I'll say is, you know, almost no legal decisions are with zero risk. So uh, it's always on a spectrum, you know, between high risk and low risk. So I, while I agree that it's quite true that uh, you would have to depend on the good graces of some future judge not to uh, allow people who have pledged not to enforce their patents to stop them from later enforcing them, I think, you know, your risk, uh, you know, um, is on the lower end of things as compared to the status quo. So it's definitely not an ironclad risk-free scenario, but few things in law are. Um, so. Okay, well, let's let's consider when and whether it is or not uh, this lot net arrangement that has been in the news this week. Uh, what it is is a, a series of agreements, I would take it, I would guess. Um, I'm not sure how, you know, they're formalizing things, but it's a um, group of companies getting together. Um, right now it has Canon, Dropbox, Google, Asana, SAP, and Newegg, and uh, I think others can join if they want. Uh, you can find it at, let's see, what's its website? Uh, lotnet.com and the idea behind it is that all of these companies are agreeing that should they ever sell their patents should they ever divest themselves of all their patents they will license all the other lotnet members to use those patents so they cannot ever be sued by a patent troll um, this if it's contractual would seem to be enforceable right Stefan? 
I think it is enforceable, um, and that's what's good about it. Uh, what's interesting about it is uh, this is uh, another one of several uh, sort of patent pooling or patent defense league type arrangements that I've seen popping up in a, the last few years. Um, it seems to be aimed at patent trolls primarily um, uh, with an interesting strategy. The, the main problem with patent trolls is that you can't countersue them because they're not making any product that you might have a patent to cover. So you're pretty much defenseless when a patent troll attacks you. Um, and so the problem with these patent defense leagues uh, is that they're useful against competitors sometimes, but they're not useful against patent trolls because even if you have 10,000 or 100,000 patents in a pool – you could draw upon to use defensively. It doesn't do any good to use a de patent defensively against trolls. It seems to me like what Laudan is trying to do is they're trying to disarm the trolls ahead of time by basically putting a poison pill basically in all the existing patents that are out there so that in five or ten years when these patents start coming up for sale as startups go go bankrupt and need to sell their patents, that they won't be able to be bought and used by trolls. So what they're trying to do is basically take the thorns off the rose ahead of time. Um, and I think it's a valiant effort, but I'm afraid that it's, it can only have so much effect. You're only going to get a certain percentage of the entire uh, existing number of live patents in the U.S. that are bound up under such an agreement. Even if you got 50 percent, there might be another – Two million live inventions out there, live patents out there that could be right. used by trolls. So it could reduce the risk somewhat, and I admire the effort, and uh, I think we're going to see more uh, attempts like this. Well, LOT, the LOT part of LOTNET, stands for License on Transfer. As of today, according to their website, they have seven members, but I could certainly see this being an attractive kind of thing a startup might want to join um, to try and protect itself against uh, patent troll lawsuits down the road. What do you think, Harry? Um, I, I really agree with what was just said. Uh, mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's a valiant effort, but it really is, you know, a finger in the dam. So, mm -hmm. you know, 500,000 plus patents get issued every year. Any one of those might be bought by a troll down the road. And I think agreements like this are probably going to only cover a very small percentage of them. On the other hand, uh, very large companies recently that have either failed or have gone belly up, for instance, you know, Nortel Networks and Polaroid and large companies of the past um, have had their patents sold off. Um, so if you can get a bunch of really large players, it might have some impact. But I, I still think it's sort of, you know, uh, just the finger in the dam uh, given how many there is something estimated, you know, two million live patents plus at any given time. So this will only cover a small percentage of them. But I, I like the idea theoretically. Uh, my, my, let me say one more thing about yeah. this, if, if it's OK. Um, I, I think that the value of this could be more against patent competitors than patent trolls because this could have a network effect where – People start joining this in an industry to get the right to use the patents in the pool defensively, like in patent defense leagues, uh, against people in their industry. And um, as I, I believe that patent competitors, that is competitors in an industry with patents, are a bigger threat than patent trolls. I think this is actually more promising than it would seem to be, um, given that it only could have so much of an effect on patent trolls. So I would expect and hope that these things could. Um, a snowball and take a, take effect in different industries. Uh, I'm a little bit worried that the uh, the the anti the FTC is going to start saying this is anti competitive. Mm. <laughs> if, if these companies that are competitors pool their patents with each other just for defensive reasons, so they're trying to get rid of an anti competitive monopoly. The government is forcing them to get to defend themselves, and that <laughs> might be called anti competitive. So you have the interplay of antitrust and patent law in a bad way. I'm afraid, um, but th there's some potential here um, in, in that respect, I think. I think my head just exploded. The, <laughs> we've got the, the government in your scenario saying you're taking monopoly tactics to get out of our monopoly law. <laughs> it's pretty funny. All right, Evan, what do you think about LotNet? 
Uh, well, you know, it's interesting because it lends itself to so many useful metaphors, cutting off the thorns from the rose ahead of time, finger yes. in the dam, <laughs> uh, poison pill. I mean, those are all very apt, and I guess we're, we're li- want to do that in when we're, we're confronted with novel situations, novel approaches like this. And, of course, I agree with what Stefan and, and Harry say here about it being of limited utility so long as there are only a few um, participants in that, which is not to say that it wouldn't work if, uh, you know, if it were uh, much larger in a, in a larger set of, of uh, companies and patent holders that were involved in it here. I think if you actually read the license agreement itself, um, excuse me, the, uh, you know, the, the, the license agreement that actually gives structure and gives, um, uh, you know, well, structure to, to how it actually works. It's really interesting how it, it works here, you know, because you've got this license that is granted to all the other members of the community, but that license doesn't take effect until immediately prior to the transfer actually happening. So it's sort of like this <laughs> weird thing that, that happens. And so we start to think of our think of like, well, where does this actually happen? When does it particularly happen? But the, you know, if, if, one of the members transfers the patent outside of the network, outside of the, 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 the membership here. That license is granted, I guess, presumably that moment before the actual assignment is, is made. So if you start thinking about it too literally, that gets sort of wacky to, to think about. But, it, of course, it has to happen that way because it's not a present license. You're not allowing all of your competitors to use the patent right as soon as you become a member. But then, of course, after it's been transferred, you no longer would have the ability to to grant the license. So it has to be that way. But it's just sort of a wacky, um, you know, novel uh, thing to, to think about how, how it's actually actually done. And the license agreement seems to be really well written and, and certainly interesting reading. Right. Isn't there something in estates and trust law that that was about a springing? I don't know. I'm trying to remember yeah. back to estates and trusts on the bar, but something that right. sprang into life on a contingency. Yeah, and uh, that's, that's, I remember those exactly. being not enforceable. So I don't know. I'm I something don't with trust me state. on this. I am I am decades away from the bar exam at this point, and springing arrangements are not fresh in my mind. Um, Let's move on to, uh, before we leave U.S. patent law and uh, its various legislative and judicial aspects, uh, let's check in with the patent office, which um, had a nominee to head it, Phil Johnson, uh, that who has now been withdrawn. Um, I guess the Obama administration took a lot of flack for nominating Phil Johnson. Uh, he's someone who was in-house with Johnson & Johnson, and uh, known as someone who uh, was a very strong proponent of strong patents and patent rights. And uh, the Obama administration decided, nope, we're just not going to nominate this guy. We've, uh, you know, who knows what their thought process was, but they backed off his nomination. And so Michelle Lee, former Googler, is still the interim head uh, until we have someone uh, nominated to head the patent office um, <laughs> Evan, I saw that. <laughs> Evan's texting me funny things on our back channel right now uh, along the lines of um, the name Johnson. So sorry, I just doubted you. <laughs> In any event, uh, let's, uh, yeah, let's, let's uh, talk about whether uh, we think that uh, this says anything about the USPTO and Michelle Lee's tenure there. Um, and if you have any guesses about who the next nominee might be, now would be the time to toss them out. What do you think, Harry? Um, well, I, I just want to say, I, I don't know uh, Phil Johnson uh, and his qualifications, but I will say, I think it is important to for the Obama administration to be putting forth somebody who is committed to really improving the patent office and experimenting and uh, trying to make things better. And I, uh, I think Dave Kapos, the former head of the patent office, did an excellent job. He was very willing to experiment. So somebody in that mold, I think Michelle Lee would be an excellent choice. I think she's uh, eminently qualified. Um, and as to Phil Johnson, whether or not uh, he was probably very qualified, but I think appearances are important. And I think it's important not to uh, pick somebody who comes to the ca- table kind of with an overhang of a predisposition one way or the other. And I think 
that was his problem. The assumption was that, uh, you know, it was going to be the status quo. That may or may not have been true, but it's, it reminds me a little bit at the FTC, uh, Tom Wheeler, who's a former cable lobbyist, you know, may or may not be predisposed towards favoring the cable industry. But the fact that he had that position sort of clouds everything that goes forward. Right. Stefan, any thoughts about uh, heading the USPTO? Denise, congratulations. You finally found a topic about which I have no opinion whatsoever. Yay! Uh, <laughs> that was possible. I, <laughs> Do I win some a, kind of prize? <laughs> I've been a registered patent lawyer for 20 years, and I didn't even know the PTO director uh, had anything to do with policy. So this is uh, <laughs> obviously uh, not something I care much about. I, I did interview Todd Dickinson, though, one time um, mm -hmm. when I was an associate patent attorney in Philadelphia. So I did meet one of the earlier patent directors. But uh, no, I have no, I don't think it matters, to be honest. Okay, Evan? Yeah, the same thing. I mean, just sort of to, to, to take off on that, it's, it seems like it's a very political decision. I don't think there's as much policy making as what there is at the FCC to tie in with what Harry was saying about the comparison to Wheeler, who brought mm -hmm. a lot of political baggage to this as well. So there's certainly something to avoid in as much as this is a political position, a political appointment. Uh, these appearances could you know, really detract from that. So I think it's, uh, it only makes sense that things are transpiring the way that, the way that they are. Okay, I think we have to make no opinion our second MCLE passphrase for this episode of This Week in Law. There we go. We've got two of them in there. And before we leave the topic of patents, let's talk about Apple briefly and the fact that it appears uh, Apple is in a battle for the, its ability under Chinese patent law to be able to put Siri into its phones sold in China because there is a patent holder in China who has a patent uh, it claims covers the Siri technology. Um, so I guess this just kind of highlights that as much as we can try and tinker with the patent system in the United States, all bets are off if you need to sell in an enormous market like China, right? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> Once again, no <laughs> opinion. <laughs> um, well, what do you I, think, I Harry? Will, I will say that uh, the um, uh, intellectual property system in China is very selectively enforced. So I'm very skeptic skeptical that, you know, to the extent there was a really objective basis behind this, because there's actually, you know, on the one hand, uh, quite rampant intellectual property law, uh, violations that happen, uh, but then occasionally, you know, the law in China steps in, and often it's you know favoring a Chinese country uh, company. Now, I guess the same could be said to some degree in the United States, but I think the system in China is much less uh, developed as compared to the United States overall. Got it, uh, Stefan. Anything to add to this? I think there's a – I put on my blog a while back, there's a Chinese proverb about uh, copying something as a beautiful thing or something like that. So they kind of have this ancient <laughs> yes. tradition, um, which I think is good. Um, right. No, Mountain not, villages not a lot of and such. Yeah, it was something like that. Um, but um, I guess you could you could you could have a little Schadenfreude here and say, uh, "Live by the IP sword, die by the IP sword." But I don't think it's a good thing ultimately. Although, as a frustrated user of Siri, I don't know how badly this will hurt them. To be honest, um, I think a more important case is there's another one. I don't think it's in the rundown. Um, there is a, a patent troll who I think is poised to collect royalties from Apple. Um, for all iPhone sales for like the next 10, 15 years and uh, for one, uh, getting 1% 1 of every iPhone sold. And apparently that's about $400 million a year. So we're talking about a $4 billion, $5, $6 billion um, payout if this if this patent troll goes through. So that could be a, a more substantial patent mm -hmm. hit coming uh, Google's way. I think they can probably get out of this one with, with, a little, with enough money. Apple's way. Yes, Apple's yes. way, sorry. All right, well, we've been talking about Aereo and its aftermath. Uh, let's look at a bit of its aftermath uh, over in the area of entertainment law.
So we mentioned that immediately after the Aereo decision, Fox went into the Ninth Circuit and said, hey, you know, this, this directly impacts part of our case against DISH. They're suing over DISH's hopper technology, but also over some streaming uh, where Fox contended that DISH was doing basically the same thing that Aereo was doing. And if Aereo shouldn't be able to do it, then DISH shouldn't be able to do it either. And uh, what happened here is they went in asking for an injunction against DISH for this kind of streaming, and the court said no, no injunction. So all that that means is uh, the court uh, decided, decided, first of all, first of all that, oops, I just got some feedback there, um, decided that uh, Aereo was narrowly decided, and le at least uh, it took the Supreme Court's admonition to heart in that regard and said, look, we're not going to start granting injunctions based on this. You're going to have to have a trial um, over whether or not this streaming service is the same thing as Aereo. So uh, any thoughts on this, Harry? Uh, yeah. So I, I think that the, uh, as was said earlier, the, the Supreme Court took great pains in Aereo to try to limit it to the facts of Aereo. Now, just because they tried doesn't mean it's always going to happen. So I think this is one example where you have a different technology and the court recognized that they didn't uh, apply, uh, the Aereo didn't apply. But I think the sort of larger commentary with Aereo is that um, we have laws that were developed in the 1970s that are being applied to the technology of 2014. And that is a major problem. So I, I don't think there was actually a clear outcome one way or another on the Aereo case for this very reason, because, uh, you know, back in the 1970s, an antenna um, was a, ver you know, several foot thing that attached to uh, a CRT TV. Uh, fast forward 40 years and antennas, you know, are uh, a fifth the size of a dime and you have a hundred of them attached to a computer card broadcasting internet, uh, broadcasting TV over the internet. These are ideas that just sim simply didn't exist 40 years ago. Uh, so I think it, it speaks to the fact that maybe um, the, the Supreme Court and the courts are going to continue to struggle with new technologies that were not anticipated, uh, kind of an antiquated legal framework. Um, but uh, the, the other point I'd say in Ariel's defense, uh, the Supreme Court uh, was sort of critical that they were taking advantage of loopholes. But Ariel was very much following the state of the law in their circuit, the second circuit. So uh, I think it's hard to say that they were taking advantage of loopholes when uh, what they were doing was actually the law of the land in their circuit until the Supreme Court uh, found otherwise. Evan, would you have been stunned if uh, the Ninth Circuit had decided uh, to go Fox's way here and grant an injunction? Well, I think that would have been sort of an unusual thing for the court to do in that stage. It was a preliminary injunction here. Because when you actually read the, the Ninth Circuit's opinion, it doesn't talk about Aereo. It talks about just the the real analysis that's going on here as to whether Fox had shown an irreparable harm. So there were mm -hmm. plenty of other reasons for the, the court to deny a preliminary injunction other than just the simple, narrow fact that it is or is not a lot like Aereo. There were other other factors here besides the likelihood of success on the merits. So given the fact that this litigation over DISH's technology has been going on for a long time and the technology has been out since January of 2012, uh, it, it comes as no surprise that there is no preliminary injunction at this point, which, uh, as I think is pretty clear by implication here, doesn't mean that ultimately this technology won't get areoed. It could. Um, that's not what the, the, the holding is here, or that's not what the conclusion right. is here from the Ninth Circuit having done what it did. So there's plenty more to be written about this, uh, the way the area may or may not apply to, to Dish Network's technology. Right, and this case is scheduled to go to trial next January. Stefan, any thoughts on uh, the role of Aereo in this case or on Aereo's uh, sort of wholehearted adoption of its new cable company moniker? Well, I think uh, well, I think Aereo is playing it smart. They may, they may still find a way to survive by doing like five ten minutes of time shifting at the customer's request, so that there's not a transmission. 
the to the public. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if they can make it. Um, um, I wasn't surprised by this. I think that there was no irreparable harm shown. I, I, I'm afraid Dish will ultimately lose. Uh, there are some differences between Dish and Aereo, but according to the Supreme Court's new test, they look a little bit like Aereo, although the word Dish doesn't sound like Aereo, so I don't know if that would make a, a new difference in the new way the Supreme Court thinks about things. But um, I'm afraid <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid they're going to be imperiled in what they're doing. But uh, maybe Aereo will find another way to. Um, to, to, to get out of this with the time shifting idea. Area right. is also trying to reclassify itself uh, somewhat unsuccessfully as a cable service as a way to survive. Right. And I mentioned that a second ago. What do you think, Harry? Are, is that going to fly? I'm a, I'm a little dubious about uh, whether they'll be able to do it, but I think they're, they're going to give it their best effort. All right. Well, we will stay tuned to the Fox case coming up in January, and we'll certainly watch uh, what happens with Aereo as they continue to try to have a business. Um, right now, I want to switch over to a story having to do with the social web. of stories and i gotta warn you they're depressing as anything uh you know usually we think of the social web we think of uh grumpy cats being the most depressing thing that might come your way and we think of the great things that uh the web becoming more social has done you know people are getting funded uh people are able to reach audiences they never could i I don't think anyone would argue that the social web has been a huge social boon in many many ways But it also, as we can see in a couple of stories, uh, one of which uh, was tweeted to me by our uh, very loyal listener, Totally Fried, who is great about tweeting us stuff and uh, putting stuff on our radar. Um, A couple of stories showing how uh, when you add a social component to an already terrible situation, a bullying, harassment kind of situation, uh, it can be, become exponentially worse. Um, and in this particular case, uh, there was a 14-year-old boy in um, San Diego uh, attending public school who uh, got sent out of his classroom for eating uh, sunflower seeds in class, not allowed. Um, so he's wandering the halls. Apparently, he was not told to go anywhere else and uh, had some time on his hands, and very soon he had other things on his hands, in his hands, in the restroom at the school. And uh, although the poor guy uh, thought he was alone, he apparently was not because another schoolmate was in there, captured the events that transpired on video, and then shared them, you know, with the public, including many, many students, members of his school, um, knew what had happened. Uh, Unfortunately, the kid's parents never knew what happened, didn't know what was coming their way because uh, they went on a family trip for Thanksgiving, and uh, this was just a couple of weeks after this uh, all went public, and uh, the poor guy um, killed himself So, and left a suicide note saying um, uh, how he just couldn't handle school and it had all you know, spun out of control. So the parents are now, you know, in this horrific situation. Obviously, the poor kid, what a what a terrible place to find yourself in as a child. As a mom, it just, the story just breaks my heart. Um, so uh, the social media component of it, I, I think, is interesting. Just, you know, it, it would have been awful just to have stories like this being told around school. Uh, but... Because it happened, you know, who knows why the kid didn't tell his parents. Maybe they could have done something to to make the situation better. But really, uh, the fact that everyone <coughs> saw this video is is what made it so awful for the guy. Um, and then, you know, in an even worse kind of situation uh, up in Northern California, uh, there was an episode involving a high school girl who passed out at a party and some boys who decided to physically take advantage of her and film themselves doing it. I'm not sure if it was photographs or video, but what have you. And then again, uh, went viral and uh, the girl reacted badly. And and once again, there was a 
suicide. Uh, we have a law that uh, may get enacted in California called Audrey's Law as a result of uh, the latter case. Um, and what, among the things that it would do is uh, if indeed some a, a minor is convicted uh, for some sort of um, sexual crime, uh, if they have taken the step of sharing pictures or texts of that crime to harass or humiliate the victim, uh, they would have a year added to their sentence. Uh, this Audrey's law also would have court proceeding for uh, teens under it, court proceedings for teens prosecuted under it made public uh, ordinarily minors court proceedings uh, in this kind of case would not be. Um, so that is pending. And I, I wanted to toss it out to you guys just to talk about um, uh, the aggra aggravating role of social media in these kinds of situations and whether the law um, should play a role in it. In the San Diego case, uh, the reason it's in the news right now is the parents are going to sue the school district, it sounds like, uh, for not taking more steps to protect their son, um, I think, when uh, the video was going around. I, they haven't filed a lawsuit, so I'm not sure what their claims are at this point. But there's also the aspect of, you know, what, what do you do to the boy who um, posted everything, made it public? Uh, according to the article in our rundown, you can access all these links at delicious.com slash thisweekinlaw slash 267 for this show. Uh, the San Diego County District Attorney's Office declined to say whether the boy who the claim says took the video might face charges under the state's anti-bullying law. However, a spokesman for the district attorney said a hearing is set for July 23rd in juvenile court on the matter. So um, there are a couple of aspects there to consider, you know, if you're going to make something like this widely public and you're a minor, what sort of consequences should there be and what sort of consequences should there be for a school to police all this? Uh, Stefan, I'll start with you. What, what do you think about all this? Well, it's obviously horrible. Both cases are horrible. Um, yeah. Um, in the first case, uh, the boy case, it's hard. It's hard to find an actual tort that should be recognized under law. Um, it's it's obviously a reprehensible act. Um, I guess you could you could pin it on um, some kind of trespass. Um, there was a use of property in violation of the say the implicit contract of the owner, which is the school district. Um, not to use property in a certain way. So you could probably find a type of trespass that was done by the guy that videoed it. And of course, in the case of the girl, we already have laws against assault and rape, which sounds like is what happened. And so I, I see no problem with the law enhancing the penalty or the damages to be awarded um, if there's if there's a violation of rights, and then um, if if it's exacerbated by, say, publishing photographs, which make the injury done to the victim uh, even worse, so I I see no problem with those kinds of things being taken into account, and I think they they should be. Whether the the extra year is the right way to go, um, I, I don't know. Uh, but um, these are obviously horrible things, um, and um, I think in these cases, pre prevention is of course more important than how we deal with it after the fact. But uh, they're sad cases. Yeah, I'm really hoping that schools in the aftermath of these kinds of events will, hopefully they already are, but but even more so, um, spending a lot of time with kids uh, discussing social media and its responsible use. Evan, what do you think about uh, penalizing people who um, take something embarrassing or, or horrific and make it public? Well, I mean, with social media, that's that has the ability to... Uh, enable someone to inflict greater harm than other methods. Uh, you know, it's much worse than an idea or a rumor, uh, you know, just going from person to person in the context of actual, you know, talking to people in the hallway or what have you. With social media, it has potential for wider distribution. And there's also this idea of the permanence of it as well. This, you know, the digital evidence could be around on the web in some form for a long, long time. So no doubt it has the ability and the capacity to aggravate the, the circumstances. And for that reason, it ought to uh, form a basis on which to enhance the sentence or somehow um, raise the level of culpability that actually happens or you know, the responsibility of what actually happens here. Make it a worse kind of crime, a higher form of criminal liability is what I'm trying to say, whether I'm saying it inartfully or, or not. Mm -hmm. The concern that I have is that 
when you single out a certain mode like social media to be that which in you know should be the basis for that enhancement i think what it can lead to is ideas of zero tolerance and uh you know because their social media, well, then this was inherently much worse, and so therefore there shouldn't be any mitigation going on because of this aggravation. Any aggravation, any aggravational aspect of this would offset any kind of mitigation that may hap- may be present because of other things going on in the context. The best comparison I can make of it is the ridiculousness that you see in a lot of situations now with zero tolerance for guns in schools. Of course, guns in schools are a terrible thing. It's one of the worst things that is present in our society today. But, you know, there are these stories of like seven-year-old kids getting expelled from school because they, you know, formed their fingers in the shape of a gun like this and pointed it at another student. That's ridiculous. That's dumb. That doesn't, mm-hmm. that doesn't address the concern and the aggravation that comes from uh, having carried an actual gun to school and murdered classmates and, and, and all of that stuff. So um, what, what, I, what I guess I'm really trying to articulate here is, yes, social, the social media aspect of this can indeed be aggravating. The law ought to do that, but it, it, we've got to be really careful to do it in a way that doesn't lead to absurd results merely because there is a social media component to it. It's got to be a pretty broad uh, analysis and there's got to be a, a, an evaluation of the entire circumstance before you start adding years onto kids' sentences just because they happen to have tweeted about it. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Evan, and and think that you know it's it's so and and I know because I'm I'm a mom and and these stories impact me very viscerally and it's so um, uh, possible. <laughs> it's it's probable even in that kind of situation that people will overreact and and want to take measures that um, may be overbroad. Uh, in trying to make sure that something like that doesn't happen again and specifically does not happen to their child. Um, So I I think it's a a really uh, dicey kind of situation that we have to watch carefully. Uh, We are talking about minor kids um, in all of these situations, both the victims and the cyber bulliers, if we want to use those terms. And uh, I should mention in the Audrey's Law case, too, that you know, when I first heard about this case, um, the word rape was used as to what happened to the girl. And maybe technically under the law, that's what this was. But, um, you know, without getting too graphic here on the show, there was no penetration. Uh, there, w- It was more of a touching than anything else. Um, so, and anyway, it actually, I'm not going to go too much into the details. You can read the story and, and get what I'm talking about. The reason I'm going into the details is I could see where the boys involved, first of all, the boys involved, you know, obviously terrible, terrible thing that they did should have been parented better to make better decisions, et cetera. But I, I could see, you know, in a situation, uh, like that, where they're d- maybe they're j- just kind of uh, not thinking they're doing anything too terribly bad, um, th- that they're just kind of messing around. That you know that they rape is not a word in their head as they're doing this. Um, so you know, again, maybe that's an educational issue, um, but I think it has to factor into you know what do you do with a child who has done this? Um, obviously. You don't want to be dealing with it after the fact. You want to be um, taking proactive measures to make sure that it doesn't happen. But, you know, if you try to put yourself into the shoes of the parents of the boys in the Audrey's Law case, um, you you might find that all of a sudden you think the law is getting pretty harsh here. Um, Harry, what do you think about all this? Uh, I certainly agree with all that's been said. It's a really tragic circumstance. And I want to echo something you and Evan said is that I think we're living in a world now where social media has the ability to magnify harms of the past that may not have been so problematic. And we're living in a new world where we have to deal with these situations, which, you know, my other in the past 30 years ago might have been just a harmful rumor now can explode on the internet in a video or posting that really drive these drastic circumstances. Uh, And, you know, technology brings benefits, but it also 
has its costs. Um, I think similarly, we uh, and really to echo a theme you just said, which is I think the social media allows teenagers to make bad decisions much worse than they would have been in the past. So, you know, the, uh, not to defend uh, the bullies in this case, who I think did a terrible thing, but, you know, teenagers have underdeveloped uh, impulse control and uh, risk-taking, and social media allows them to turn bad decisions into really bad decisions that lead to tragic results. So it's something we just need to be aware of in this new world, and it's not really going away. Um, from a larger level, I would say, as, as a law professor, I am definitely skeptical about any law that tends to be a reactive law that reacts to a particular incident. So without having looked at the details of uh, Audrey's law one way or the other, I just want to say in general, laws that get passed in response to a particular incident have a tendency uh, to have unintended consequences down the road. Um, and I'm really not a fan of sort of emotional, reactive lawmaking of this way, generally speaking. Yep, something to be very, very cautious of as uh, you try to deal with these situations and make policy decisions around them. Uh, let's uh, lighten things up substantially, maybe jarringly, um, with, uh, let's go to our resource of the week, too, so at first, so it's not too jarring. Uh, the net neutrality uh, debate has somewhat sopad the FCC site as it was uh, trying to uh, deal with all the comments it was getting this week. It had an initial deadline of July 15th uh, to close the initial comment period on the pending open internet proposal. They've gone ahead and extended that to tonight at midnight Eastern time. Uh, if you have not gotten in your comments to the FCC, now would be the time. If you need some refreshers on uh, net neutrality, of course, there are lots of resources out there for it. But if you wanted a more lighthearted one, uh, call it, the people at College Humor have done one. So I just wanted to point you toward that briefly. Bruce, I am your father. Hi, I'm Adam. And I'm Emily. We make funny videos on the internet. But soon, we might not be able to. That's because net neutrality is in jeopardy. Net neutrality is the principle that says that ISPs, you know, these can't discriminate between different types of traffic. That means that whether you're a bedroom music producer, a couple with an amateur porn site, or ah! just someone with a great startup idea. <laughs> it's like Dropbox for your food. Great idea. Hope it we'll, works We'll out. end on Dropbox you for your to food. It uh, goes on uh, for quite some time uh, going through, um, obviously, one side of the net neutrality debate. Um, so, you know, I, I would encourage you to seek out uh, more detailed and serious resources on net neutrality, but uh, every now and then you have to have to lighten things up. And the main point uh, here is that uh, Friday tonight is the, the first deadline, and then September 10th will be the deadline for reply comments uh, let, let to also, the FCC. Uh, yes. Uh, let me also give a shout out to, if you haven't seen John Oliver's hilarious and brilliant take on net neutrality. You can find it on YouTube. I think uh, really funny and uh, just a brilliant piece of social commentary. I think it's a nice compliment to the video you just showed, uh, both informative and humorous as well. And he just seems to nail that informative and humorous uh, milieu. So good for him or metier maybe is what I'm thinking of for John Oliver. So um, Yes, definitely uh, check those out. And uh, once again, pay attention to net neutrality. Get those comments in. Uh, oh, it bears mentioning here, too, they've topped a million comments to the FCC and are closing in on the record <coughs> number of comments on any issue that the FCC has ever received. That was 1.4 million. And uh, guess what that was on? That was uh, for the Janet Jackson uh, uh, clothing malfunction. At the Super Bowl. <laughs> so um, arguably, this is a far more important issue. So I uh, hope you're paying attention. And uh, our tip of the week would be um, for anyone wishing to make a boat in the country of Japan uh, that is a digitally accurate rendering of their vajayjay. 
uh, that has been found to be illegal in Japan. So uh, there's a really hysterical YouTube video on this that highlights uh, the, the poor artist who wanted to make it. It was sort of like a kayak um, <laughs> that uh, she had digital scans done to um, make it uh, a, an accurate representation of uh, her nether regions. And uh, the whole point of this artist's work is to demystify uh, the pussy, as she calls it. And uh, she, she makes uh, iPhone cases and various other things. Here she uh, sought to make a boat, uh, but no, it violated the country's obscenity laws. So um, our tip would be, uh, I guess you can't do that in Japan. Sorry, anyone who had uh, similar designs. Um, <laughs> the uh, the irony of all this uh, is, too, that uh, apparently um, fertility parades in Japan are very common uh, with full three-dimensional renderings of the uh, male genitalia, but that apparently is not problematic under the law at all. So a bit of a double standard going on there. <laughs> Um, our tip would be uh, not to make uh, your VJJ a boat in Japan. Uh, so I hope I've sufficiently <laughs> lightened things up here at the end of the show. It's been so fun uh, talking about uh, both heady and lighthearted issues uh, with Harry Surden from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Harry, so great having you back. Thank you so much for having me. It's really been a pleasure. I um, always uh, enjoy doing this. So thank you. Good. We'll definitely have you back again. Tell us, uh, though, in the meantime, um, what you have coming up. If anything, uh, folks in the area uh, could come by for or keep an eye out for or uh, anything folks online could. A absolutely. So once the semester starts up, which for us is uh, late August, it's coming up, uh, the University of Colorado Silicon Flatirons has a series of really interesting conferences on privacy, patent law, Internet law, open to the public. Uh, so come on. There's a lot going on at the University of Colorado in terms of entrepreneurship, intellectual property law, um, computers and law. So come on down if you're in Boulder. We're always happy to see you. Great. Would love to do that when we're in town. Well, uh, you know, obviously great to get to Colorado whenever you can. Uh, Stefan, uh, I love getting to Houston, too. It's I was reminiscing with a friend who has... Um, a youngster about the age of mine that pretty soon we're going to have to get on over to NASA and take them on the tour. Uh, other than interesting uh, space tourism, uh, what, what else uh, is going on in your neck of the woods? Well, um, I am working on a, a collection of my uh, law review articles and essays called Law in a Libertarian World, which should be coming out as a book in the next six to nine months whenever I finish it up. So I'm working on that. Um, and another IP uh, monograph called Copy This Book, so that would be another year or so. So I'm working on those things in the background while I'm doing my legal practice and uh, raising an 11-year-old and uh, trying to keep keep the Ford under control here. But everything is good, and I really appreciate yep. the show. Nice to meet you, Harry, and nice uh, it was well. as enjoyable as, as, as ever. So great to chat with you again, Stefan. And yes, uh, raising an 11-year-old in addition to everything else you have going on is definitely a lot to juggle, so good luck with that. And uh, Evan, you've got your hands full too in that regard. Yeah. Are you done with that Japan story yet? I'm done you with got... the Japan oh, story. Okay. <laughs> Once again, you can blame. I think it was, again, totally fried, or it was someone else on Twitter who pointed me toward that, and I went, okay, that's going to be our tip. Okay, good. I can't <laughs> believe you were getting after me for the things I was Skyping you when you were. Um, I know, I know. That, so. um, yes, great fun. Yeah, as uh, it li certainly lived up to the expectations. I knew this would be a fun conversation with you, Harry, and with you, Stefan. Lots of fun. You know, so great way to spend uh, Friday afternoon, especially in the summertime. So good times, and uh, it was great to be here. Wonderful to see you, as always, Evan, and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend here at the end of the summer. Uh, we don't have any breaks coming up uh, anytime soon. We'll let you know if we do um, as the summer winds down. Uh, so we're just going to keep on chugging away. We're going to keep on posting 
those at uh, twit.tv slash twill and at youtube.com slash this week in law. If you've missed any of our other recent shows, that's where you're going to find them. Uh, what else? You can watch us on Roku. That's always a fun way to go. And uh, in iTunes, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, if you want to send us just completely face palm stories that uh, you'd like us to um, put on the show, <laughs> the way to do that would be to uh, send us a tweet. Evan is Internet Cases, and I'm D Howell on Twitter. Or if you have a more lengthy exposition you'd like to give us, head on over to our Facebook or Google Plus page, and we'll chat with you there. Or you could email us uh evan is evan at twit.tv i'm denise at twit.tv we love hearing from you however you decide to get in touch with us because uh really we couldn't do the show without you you give us so many great ideas and suggestions uh keep us up to speed on things uh, that we haven't been paying attention to so we really really appreciate all the help and uh with that we'll go ahead and wrap up this episode of this week in law and we'll see you next week thanks for everything take care